What's going on, guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit. I got the day off from work today for my birthday, so I figured I'd use that time for good instead of evil and bring you guys all that sweet content that we love to use to make our GMs question why they even play Pathfinder in the first place, slash to make our players question why they even play Pathfinder in the first place. We're going to continue Neo Cal's requests. We're going to talk about the two-thirds casters, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorites, one that I'm playing every Saturday, the War Priest. Time to go to church, guys. Dig in. Before we get down to that, though, we're going to shout out our patrons today. This episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit is brought to you by my War Priests game master, Joseph Arvilla. Thank you so much for your help, Joe. It means the world and to everybody else out there. Patronage is the number one way to see this channel become super powerful, super awesome, and if you'd like to help out, our Patreon link is, as always, in the description. So we're going to be starting these videos with a basic overview of the class. A War Priest has a D8 hit dice, and is one of the hybrid classes from the Advanced Class Guide. In this case, we'll be combining the Cleric and the Fighter to make something more. We are a two-thirds caster, which means in addition to Orisons, we have spells at 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th level. We're a two-thirds Bab with good will saves and good fort saves. A war priest must also be within one step of his deities if they have a deity's alignment along either the law chaos axis or the good evil axis. So if we were to build a war priest of, say, the lawful good god of hunters, Erastal, we need to be lawful good, lawful neutral, or neutral good. If we were to build a war priest of Gazra, we must be lawful neutral, neutral, neutral good, neutral evil, or chaotic neutral. You guys get the idea. Of all the alignment restrictions out there, this is the one and only one that I agree with because it makes sense because you're literally asking a higher power for your power. A war priest is defined, in my opinion, at least by two abilities. First and foremost, the war priest has an ability known as sacred weapon. At first level, weapons wielded by a war priest are charged with the power of his faith. In addition to the favored weapon of his deity, the War Priest can select a weapon as a sacred weapon by selecting that weapon with the weapon focus feat. If he has multiple weapon focus feats, the ability applies to all of them. Whenever the War Priest hits with his sacred weapon, the weapon damage is based on his level and not the weapon type. The War Priest can decide to use the weapon's base damage instead of the sacred weapon damage, which must be declared before the attack roll is made, but I don't think you necessarily have to declare it if you are a first level war priest and your sacred weapon damage is 1d6 and you're rolling in with a great sword. This is powerful because eventually, no matter what weapon you want to wield, no matter what flavor you're trying to have, at 20th level, your weapon will have a base damage of 2d8. Even at 5th level, your weapon does a d8 damage, which isn't super awesome necessarily for this build in particular or other builds, but say you're going to play like a War Priest of Verazma, whose favorite weapon is a dagger, or any other deity with a little teeny tiny favorite weapon, there's the buff you need. The second thing that defines a War Priest is the Blessings ability. A War Priest's deity influences his alignment, what magic he can perform, his values, and how others see him. Each War Priest can select two blessings from among those granted by his deity. Each deity grants blessings tied to their domains. A War Priest can select an alignment blessing only if his alignment matches that domain. If a War Priest isn't devoted to a particular deity, he still selects two blessings to represent his spiritual inclinations and abilities. Subject, of course, to GM approval. Each of these blessings grants a minor power at 1st level and a major power at 10th level. A War Priest can call upon the power of his blessings a number of times per day in any combination equal to 3 plus half his level. Each time he calls upon any one of his blessings, it counts against the daily limit, and save DCs are equal to 10 plus half his level plus his wisdom mod. This is also your casting modifier. Now, there is one more ability that the War Priests get that is really powerful, and some would probably say class-defining. I don't necessarily feel that way about it because I feel like a lot of classes get something similar to this. We're going to shout it out anyway. The ability is called Fervor. He has the ability to use his Fervor ability a number of times per day equal to half his War Priest level plus his wisdom. By expending one use of this ability, a good War Priest can heal 1d6 plus an additional 1d6 for every three War Priest levels. An evil War Priest, not unlike an evil Cleric, can do this the other way, healing the undead or harming the living. 
but that's not super important. What's super important is as a swift action, a war priest can expend one use of his fervor ability to cast any one war priest spell he has prepared with a casting time of one round or shorter. When cast in this way, the spell can target only the war priest, even if it could normally affect multiple targets. Spells cast in this way ignore somatic components and don't provoke. Essentially, if you need to heal yourself, that's a swift action. If you need to buff yourself, that's a swift action. I'm not necessarily going to shout to the rafters about this one because I feel like most people who are trying to play some kind of combat caster will take Quicken Spell eventually anyway, but it's still definitely super powerful, and a lot of War Priests will take a trait to use this for even more power. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, our War Priest is going to be one of those War Priests who isn't tied to a specific deity. This is a super meta way to say this, but in 20 levels, our war priest is going to have a bit of a change of faith. Our war priest, who is going to be an archer, will need to eventually worship Erastal, though we don't really need that until 20th level. Erastal's domains are animal, community, good, law, and plant. This, of course, would allow us access to the relevant blessings, but those aren't the blessings we want. Those aren't the blessings that are particularly super good. Our war priest, who is an archer, wants to have access to the air blessing. There are other relatively strong blessings, and I'm not necessarily saying this is the most powerful because our minor blessing is kind of situational, but of all the situational things, it's probably the most powerful. And you can always make the situation work for you with good roleplay and tactics. The reason we're taking the air blessing primarily is for Zephyr's gift. At first level, you can touch any one ranged weapon and enhance it with the quality of air. For one minute, any attacks made with the weapon take no penalties due to range. In addition, making a ranged attack with this weapon doesn't provoke an attack of opportunity. That means we have an effective range with a composite longbow of 550 feet. Normally we have 5 range increments with our ranged weapons and we take a progressive neg 2 on our attack rolls with our ranged weapon for every range increment we're trying to fire in. So, no penalties for attacking something within 110 feet, minus 2 for 110 to 220. You get the idea. With Zephyr's Gift, anybody that's 550 feet away is fair game. You know that neg 20 you take on stealth checks when sniping? Yeah, when you're 550 feet away, I think we can go ahead and ignore that because where did that arrow come from? Now, you know what would make this even better? If we could fly somehow. Oh, wait. At 10th level, we get Soaring Assault, which allows us to touch an ally, remember, we count as our own ally, and give them the gift of flight for one minute as fly. The ally gains a fly speed of 60 feet with average maneuverability, and gets a bonus on fly checks equal to your level. Whenever the ally succeeds at a charge attack, the ally deals an additional amount of electricity damage equal to your level, which is cool, but that means we can just fly up in the air, shoot down, of course it's only 10 rounds, but we become the giant tower over the battlefield. No one does anything unless we say they can. Every spellcaster will always be in range of us for us to interrupt spells, and again, if somebody tries to run off, we just pick them up. Easy peasy. Of course, if we want our war priest to be unaligned, we can choose air and whatever other blessing we might want. I prefer the luck blessing, personally. And though we're not necessarily here to talk about deities, we do have access to two core deities. We've covered one of them that give us access to the air blessing. Those being Gazra, and if you'd like to learn more about Gazra, you can click right here, and Shellin. Of course, we want to stay kind of close to lawful good, so we're not going to choose the Horsemen of Pestilence Apollyon. By the way, we talked about Apollyon in our Wednesday afternoon worship series right here, if you'd like to check that out. Shellen is usually my go-to for my war priest. That may be because I was in a party with an Oread war priest who worshipped Shellen, and I was playing an archer, so I benefited a lot from this. But Shellen has the luck domain, which gives us access to the luck blessing. At first level, we get Lucky Presence. We can touch an ally, and they can call upon our Lucky Presence to roll any one ability check, attack roll, saving throw, or skill check twice and take the better result. Once used or after a minute, it goes away, but that's still... Here you go. Standard action. You have advantage. Probably the strongest thing in the game. If you roll natural one and natural one, that was probably just fated to happen. At 10th level, we get Unlucky Enemy. As an immediate action, you can force an adjacent opponent to re-roll an attack saving throw, or skill or ability check it just attempted, and it must take the lower of the two rolls. You must of course declare this after the roll is made, but before the result is revealed, but that's still as an immediate action, 
disadvantage to somebody at the same time you or your friends have advantage, the probability gets skewed in your favor, and thus this is really powerful. The bad guy does have to be adjacent to you, and you're an archer, so that's kinda weird, but Zephyr's Gift means our bow doesn't provoke an attack of opportunity, the synergy is there, and it's super powerful. So long story short, for this war priest, we want to start out, if our GM is very much a stickler on deities, worshipping Shellen, and then eventually, if we think the game will last, and strictly if we think the game will last only up to 20th level, shifting over to worship of Erastil. We will lose access to both of our blessings at this point, but we won't necessarily need them in a game that goes to level 20 with access to magic, and again, we're a caster. We'll explain why we're going to do that here in a second. First though, let's talk about traits. Like any other caster, a war priest can benefit from the stuff we talked about in our Magus optimization video. You can check that out right up here. But that's up to you if you want to take something like Magical Lineage for Cure Light Wounds, which is pretty strong. But the classic war priest trait, the one that we can abuse pretty easily along with Fervor, is called Fates Favored. It's very simple. Whenever you are under the effect of a luck bonus of any kind, that bonus increases by one. And you might be saying, oh, but Tommy, nothing gives a luck bonus. This is an enhancement bonus, and this is a sacred bonus. Hang on a second. War Priest spells come from the Cleric spell list. And just off the top of my head, here's three pretty awesome spells that give us a luck bonus. The classic level one Cleric, or in our case, War Priest spell, Divine Favor, grants us a plus one luck bonus on attack and weapon damage rolls for every three caster levels you have, at least one, maximum three, or at least two, maximum four. As a swift action with fervor for one minute, that stacks with pretty much anything we're gonna have. Divine Favor does have two bigger brothers, Prayer, which is a plus one luck bonus on attack rolls, weapon damage rolls, saves, and skill checks. If we don't cast this with fervor, it also applies to all of our friends within a 40 foot radius. And with no saving throw, our enemies take a neg one penalty on the same rolls. Divine Favor's other bigger brother, Divine Power, grants us a plus one bonus on attack rolls, weapon damage rolls, strength rolls, and strength-based skill checks for every three caster levels you have, maximum of plus six or plus seven because we have Fates Favored. We also gain one temporary hit point per caster level, and when we make a full attack, we can make an additional attack at our full bab. Of course, this is not cumulative with haste or the speed special ability, but we can cast haste on ourselves essentially as a swift action. It's super powerful, and on top of that, there are several items floating throughout the game, not unlike a luck stone, that grant luck bonuses to pretty much everything we need. One item we have to shout out, though that item has been eroded into the ground, the Jean Gasa of the Fortunate Soldier, which grants us a plus one luck bonus to our armor class, or, you know, again, a plus two because we have Fate's Fate. Favored, and once a day allows us to negate a critical or sneak attack. Unfortunately, the Jingasa has been eroded to give us instead a plus one deflection bonus to armor class, so it's a ring of protection. We can spend an immediate action to negate a crit or sneak attack when struck, and that ability now functions only once after we use it. Though we keep the deflection bonus, we lose the ability to stop critical hits. If your GM is letting you play pre errato pick up this item, super strong. Your second trait, again, is whatever you want it to be. It's a mixed bag, you can do whatever it is you want. So now let's talk about our ability scores. So we're gonna be building an archer today, and archers can be pretty multiple ability dependent to make sure we can reliably get that damage through. With that in mind, we must prioritize our dexterity for our attack roll, our strength for our damage roll, but of course, depending on the point by and depending on the amount of magic items and magic item crafters we have floating about the world, as always, dipping Paladin for Smite Evil and slapping our Charisma on our attack rolls can help us get our damage through. And in addition, we need to make sure our Wisdom modifier is as competitive as our Strength and or Dexterity because not only is that our Casting modifier, it's entirely the reason we're converting to a Rastal Worship at some point in the game. Anybody who's watched this series through knows what we're talking about, but for everybody else, I'm going to keep you in suspense for now. We'll talk about it when we get to the feats. Long story short, for our race, just prioritize those three ability scores. Any race, as always, can do anything. Now, one thing that is worth mentioning is the Human War Priest's favored class bonus is one-sixth of a new bonus combat feat. Really quickly, for those of us who don't know what a favored class bonus is, because it can be kind of confusing, each character begins play with a single favored class of his choosing. Typically, this is the same class as the class you choose at first level. 
Whenever a character gains a level in his favored class, he receives either one hit point or one skill rank. Alternatively, we can spend our favored class bonus instead of getting an extra skill rank or an extra hit point on certain situational, sometimes flavorful, sometimes powerful effects in the case of the human war priest that's one sixth of a new combat feat. What that means is, after six levels of investing your favored class bonus into this, you receive a new combat feat. So essentially, at level 6, at level 12, and at level 18, if you invested your entire favored class bonus, you would receive three new feats. So I think I'm going to go ahead and say, and again, any class can play anything, the human probably makes the best war priest. So yeah, we'll commit to it. Human war priest. Now, assuming we invest into our War Priest's favored class bonus at every level, and we stack on the bonus feats that we get at third level and every three levels thereafter, and the extra bonus feat we get from being a human that puts us at a grand total of 20 feats with this build. In addition to that, a War Priest can select feats that have a minimum number of fighter levels as a prerequisite and can treat his War Priest level as his base attack bonus for the purpose of qualifying for the bonus feats he gains from normal class progression. That means our archer can have, and probably will have, all the things our archer can do, whatever he wants to do, and even though he's a two-thirds bab, our archer can take the vital strike feats if we're worried about not being able to hit as well, and eventually our 1d8 longbow will be doing 2d8 damage, slap the impact enchantment on to make that 3d6, and we can attack with our longbow for a whopping 12d6 damage. If we decide that converting to a Rasta Worship isn't in our best flavorful interest, we can do that much damage from 550 feet away, meaning we can probably do that much damage over two or three turns before the actual combat has begun. Before these guys are close enough to us to be returning fire, unless they have a bunch of wizards, in which case you just hold your attack action, they cast, you shoot, they take a bunch of damage, and if they don't die outright, their spell is almost certainly disrupted. Of course, we'll be taking all the staple feats for an archer. We're talking deadly aim, precise shot, point-blank shot, which is weird considering we'll be shooting from super far, but prerequisites are what they are. Precise shot and eventually improve, because why not? We have the feats. But I prefer to play my divine characters as vital strikers. If your GM will allow you to play a pantheist, worship Shellen, and Erastal, which is perfectly feasible in a world where there's a bajillion gods floating around, the Weapon of the Chosen feat tree is pretty powerful. The first two feats in the tree are kind of negligible and not really worth talking about, especially considering a war priest like a paladin can put enhancement bonuses on his weapon, so we're not necessarily worried about overcoming damage reduction or concealment. No, it's Greater Weapon of the Chosen that makes those two really rough feat taxi things worth taking. It reads, when you use your deity's favored weapon, Erastals is a longbow, to attempt a single attack with the attack action, you roll two dice for your attack roll and take the higher. You do not need to use Weapon of the Chosen to gain this benefit, and as usual, the reroll does not apply to any confirmation rolls. A single attack with the attack action. Now, people will argue what Vital Strike does and doesn't work on, and there are feats out there that allow you to cherry pick it. For example, if you worship Gorum and use a great sword, you can Vital Strike and Charge. A talent exists for Vigilantes to sometimes Vital Strike with attacks of opportunity. But the thing about that is most of the single attack things, like charging, are actions that you commit to doing. A great example of this, and this is a feat we would take and probably should take if our GM is a little loosey-goosey with how Vital Strike works, is Focused Shot. As a standard action, you may make an attack with a bow or crossbow and add your intelligence modifier to the damage. Note how it says you may. Greater Weapon of the Chosen reads, when you use your deity's favored weapon to attempt a single attack with the attack action, you roll two dice for your attack roll and take the higher result. You don't have a choice. You do it because Erastal says so. Now, I guess a particularly vindictive GM could say, oh, you can't vital strike. You have to use Greater Weapon of the Chosen. Look at the way it reads. Ha 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 ha. But GMs don't. Because you as the game master have the power that that deity has to revoke their spells, revoke their powers if you think they're abusing it. And really the two other weapon of the chosen feats are kind of rough feat taxes if they're willing to jump this far into it. Let them have it. Now that we're done with that rant, snapshot and improve snapshot will allow you to threaten out to 10 feet with your bow. 
and you don't provoke attacks of opportunity when making a ranged attack as an attack of opportunity. But the piece de resistance and the reason we convert to Erastal worship in this build is Erastal's deific obedience. We've talked about this before in an archery contest video. You can check that out right up here. I'm still kind of inclined to believe the monk can do this a little better. However, the monk can't do it and also have spell casting available. And we're using a bow and have a pretty good wisdom modifier probably anyway. So yeah, of course, we're going to take it. To do this, we will have to dip evangelist. And that means the war priest's capstone ability, which allows you once a day as a swift action to treat your level as your base attack bonus. It gives you DR 10 over everything and allows you to move at full speed regardless of armor or encumbrance while also allowing the blessings you call upon to not count against your daily limit for a minute. Seems good, but it's only a once per day, and Faithful Archer is forever. Faithful Archer reads, When using a longbow, you add your wisdom bonus on attack and damage rolls against targets within 30 feet. It's so good, there's no reason that you don't take it. Honestly, if you want to be a powerful archer, you worship a rastal. There's almost no exception from the point of view of the min-maxer. Before any other fancy hoops are jumped through, that means we'll be using our dexterity and wisdom to our attack roll, and our strength and wisdom to the damage roll. If we are willing to dip Paladin for a once-a-day smite evil, or we gestalt with a Paladin super strong, or we have a Paladin in our party who's using Aura of Justice, we can make this even better, and we can go Dexterity, Wisdom, Charisma to attack rolls, Strength, Wisdom, Paladin level to the damage rolls, but we probably like the feat a little better, we probably like the extra spell we can cast a little better, so this build is going to assume War Priest 19, Evangelist 1. And now, with no further ado, let's get down to combat. A given player character gets an ability score increase at 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20. We're going to invest a single point into our dexterity, three points into our strength, and one point into our wisdom, assuming our wisdom started at something odd. We'll assume we're playing a human, and we'll assume that human put his plus two into his dexterity. We will assume the dice were with us and or we're playing a high point by and we'll begin play with 20 dexterity, 18 strength, and 15 wisdom. If we don't plan on multi-classing paladin, our charisma can be dumped, our intelligence can be dumped because we can't use focus shot rules as written, and we don't even necessarily have to worry too terribly hard about our con score, although don't dump your con into the ground unless you want to dump your body into the same ground in an early grave. It is for that reason we're going to assume we get our hands on a belt of physical perfection because no one doesn't want to buff their con, but we only really need a wisdom headband. After getting our hands on our belt of physical perfection and our tomes and manuals that will allow us to increase our ability scores by up to plus five, of course they're very expensive, but get your hands on an item crafter, save a town, get crafting prices, you'll figure it out. We landed a dexterity score of 34 with a 12 modifier, a strength score of 32 with an 11 modifier, and a wisdom score of 26 with a modifier of 8. Since that evangelist dip doesn't do anything for our base attack bonus, our base attack will round out at 14, 9, 4. Fortunately, our class kind of forces us to take weapon focus with the weapon we use, not that that's necessarily a bad thing. So after we crunch all the math, our full attack action with rapid shot and deadly aim turned all the way up it comes out to a base attack of 14, plus 1 from weapon focus, plus 12 from our dexterity, plus 5 for the enchantment on our bow, whether we pay for that or use sacred weapon is up to us and our coin purse, I suppose, plus 7 from divine power, plus 1 from point blank shot, and plus 8 from our wisdom bonus if we're within 30 feet, so I guess I shouldn't say that Dipping Evangelist just was horrible for our base attack. Minus two from Rapid Shot and minus four from Deadly Aim makes our base attack come out to 42, 42, 42. One more again, we're going to assume we have the speed enchantment or some other way of getting an extra attack in a full attack action since we can literally cast it. I'm sure we can figure it out. 37, 32. Not bad, certainly very respectable, but like every other min-maxing video I've ever made, I'm going to compare these numbers to the armor class of the great old one Cthulhu. Our highest base attack needs only a 7 to hit, but our worst needs a 17 to make sure we get our damage through, so sometimes vital striking on this character will be necessary. If we're using vital strike, we aren't using rapid shot, so that means our single attack comes down to a plus 44 to hit, and that plus 44 to hit is rolled with advantage. Thank you so much, greater weapon of the chosen. 
If your war priest needs to only make a standard action attack, you're almost certain to hit. Again, if you roll a natural one and then a natural one, I think that attack roll missing was just kind of your destiny. Now, if we dip Evangelist, we never see the full 2d8 damage that a war priest can get from leveling to 20, but we still can get to 2d8 on our 2d6 with the impact enchantment. When our longbow connects, we will do 2d8 points of damage, plus 5 from our enchantment, plus 11 from our strength, 8 from our wisdom, and 1 from point blank shot if we're within 30 feet, plus 7 from divine power, and plus 8 from deadly aim, setting us pretty at 2d8 plus 40 damage, or an average of 49 every successful attack. Of course, the first attack with many shot does double damage because everything we do is multiplied times two as we fire two arrows. There's no precision damage here, it's all ability scores or spells or weapon enchantments, which looks even better at 48 plus 80 or an average of 99 points of damage when that first arrow connects. If all five of our shots connect, we will do 295 damage to a given opponent or across the sea of given opponents because again, we're an archer. We aren't necessarily gonna be crit crunching today because even a keen longbow only crits 19 to 20, but it's important to note that if our first attack, the one that's using many shot does crit, we do not add the critical damage to the second arrow. So when we crunch that math, 49 times 3, which is 147 damage, plus 5 extra rounds of 49 damage hitting the bad guy, means on average we'll assign 392 damage in a full attack with the first one being a critical hit. There's two ways our full attack archer can make this go a little higher. We didn't necessarily take these feats because we want to make room for Weapon of the Chosen and Vital Strike, because if we get played against and we get many shot taken away from us, our damage falls on its face and we need to be able to counter. But we'll bring them up here real fast for those of you who are interested and those of you who do not want to go the Vital Strike Weapon of the Chosen route. The first one is a bonus to damage that I nearly always forget when I use it. Hammer the gap. When you take a full attack action, each consecutive hit against the same opponent deals extra damage equal to the number of previous consecutive hits you have made against that opponent this turn. This damage is multiplied on a critical hit. So what that means is since we have five attacks in a full attack action, if all five of them connect, the second attack would deal an additional one damage, the third attack would deal an additional two, fourth attack deals an additional three, and fifth attack does an additional four. So we would assign 10 extra damage, and that damage is multiplied times three if we end up critting. But again, I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, if I have the ability to take Vital Strike, I will always take Vital Strike because it's not hard for a game master to reduce somebody to only taking a standard action in a round even on a war priest who could swift action some kind of restoration to remove whatever is afflicting him, eventually you just run out of resources. The second feat, and this feat is either very, very, very important or not important at all, depending on your meta, is clustered shots. When you use a full attack action to make multiple ranged weapon attacks against the same opponent, total that damage from all hits before applying that opponent's damage reduction. If you're using massive damage, that rule applies if the total damage you deal with this feat is equal to or exceeds half the opponent's full normal hit points, minimum 50 points of damage. It sounds really good, and truly it is if you're fighting a lot of things with DR, but if your campaign or your GM is making a lot of, say, like human fighters or human wizards or something like that, Things with class levels that are powerful because of their class levels and not because of what they are is entirely wasted. And it feels bad to call clustered shots a trap because against demon lords it's gonna shine. But if it's not for your meta, it's just not for your meta. That said, it won't be hard to do half of somebody's hit points pretty reliably with this build, so if you're playing massive damage, by all means grab this. Vital Strike as a standard action will be 2d8 plus 40, averaging 49, plus an additional 6d8 damage, which will average in a standard action attack 76 damage. That extra 6d8 is not multiplied on a critical, so if we crit, we only multiply the average of 49 times 3, then slap that 27 on for a total of 174 damage. Yeah, that's way, way less, no argument from me, but again, with greater weapon of the Chosen, the 44 to hit 
that we roll for our standard action single attack is rolled with advantage. It's rolled twice and we take the higher of the two d20 rolls to use on our attack roll, which means unless again we roll a natural one and a natural one and the fates are not with us, that we are going to hit. Also, if we have to take a move action in a given round, also if something should happen to stagger us, a lot of our damage falls off because to use many shot we have to take the full attack action. And the full attack that we just demonstrated assumes every single solitary attack connected that may not always happen. Matter of fact, it probably won't always happen. So make sure you have Vital Strike. You never know when you're gonna need it, and it's super helpful to have it when you do. Now we've talked about super optimized parties in the past, and if you'd like to see my take on that, you can follow this card up here. The War Priest takes up a really awkward spot in the optimized party, but that's not to say that's a bad thing because the War Priest can pretty much sub in for anyone. The War Priest casts as if he is a cleric. At the end of the day, he will have access to heal. He will have access also to hold person. So if somebody goes down, he can bring them back up. Or if someone needs to go down, he can paralyze them for you. This build as an archer means you're really good at anti-spellcasters and you're really good at flying stuff. But change out one of our feats for weapon focus, the reach weapon of your choice, and you become just as adept of a Punisher as the Punisher is. Of course, you might want to trade out some other feats so you can get to combat patrol, but you still do a crazy amount of damage with your reach weapon. So if you need to stand up and start coup de growing, you can do so. You're not playing a cleric because you have more options on the war priest. You have a little bit better to hit and your buffs come down faster on you than they would on a cleric who didn't take quicken spell. It's a very strong class and I definitely recommend it. But what do you guys think about it? Did I do my math wrong somewhere? Have you played a war priest that could do more damage than this one could? If so, throw it in the comments below and we'll keep the conversation going. I'm not entirely sure when the next episode of min maxing for fun and profit will come down. I'm not exactly sure which class we'll be talking about, but I will say that it will be one of the two-thirds casters, and I will say that as soon as I can find the time in my life to do it, I'll get it out to you. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. We'll see you next time.